Dr. Kampel for invitation for me to come from Germany to give you just a short overlook on the work I do there using some special methods like biofeedback or medical hypnotherapy combined with techniques you know for cell regulation in the use of microcurrent therapies. I used these techniques since 25 or 30 years now, I think, and I got my primary training in lots of psychophysiological methods 30 years before in Russia, in the US, in Great Britain, and got the knowledge that I could try to use these methods in different kinds of patients. Most of the patients I treat with such methods are of course patients with pain, anxiety, depression, or patients after stroke. And I got the feeling that all these methods are able only, not only to help the patients to relieve their symptoms, but it's also possible to help them to prevent these diseases and symptoms. And that's for me also a kind of well-being or wellness, to help the patients to feel better and to do something what's possible uh, to avoid symptoms. And that's why. I will, do, will give you in my first talk this morning an overview about these methods. Later on, after lunch, maybe if it's possible technically, a short demonstration how biofeedback techniques can apply, how it looks like. And so I start viewing the garden in my sight. If I look out of a window in my clinic, I see these flowers, and I saw that take them with me to Bangkok to show you also have flowers in Germany. Yeah. And uh, what are, from my point of view, wellness therapies? I think wellness therapies can be therapies to increase one's well-being and to minimize any chance of becoming ill. It means prevention. And prevention of lots of diseases are a big chance for us to use methods, technical methods, biophysiological methods to keep the patient in a situation be stable, to be resistant, to avoid further diseases. Well, this, from my point of view, exists on a continuum that ranges from disease and ability to optimal health that a person can realistically achieve. What are wellness therapies? Forms of complementary and alternative medicines. Complementary and alternative medicines not all rural countries are very popular. In Germany or in Western countries at the moment were really increased because lots of patients ask, what can I do else without any pharmacological treatment? And so the interest in this patient's group are very high to do something also in kind of self-regulatory processes which improve the abilities to avoid illness or to do anything against the symptoms they have. So I felt complementary medicine as a combination of conventional and alternative techniques, both together. And alternative medicine is a substitute for conventional medicine. And so these methods are really improving at the moment very, very, very fast. The focus on a lifestyle can be to reduce the risk of illness. And all the enemies of well-being are pain, depression, anxiety, paralysis. If you have a patient with pain, you can tell him, try to relax or do anything what feels good, he cannot do it. If it's a patient who caused by anxiety or depression, he feels so sad that you can do wellness in every time, he cannot accept this, he cannot feel how it feels to be relaxed. And so the methods I'm using and give him a possibility to learn how it feels to relax and use methods to do it at home and everywhere. And also another question is what about normal aging? Normal aging is a normal process and everything we do helps the patient maybe to live longer as well, if he feels well, if he feels good, and even if he can do anything to avoid illnesses. These wellness therapies, which get more and more popular, these wellness therapies, which get more and more popular, um, <coughs> is coming from because people seeking 
alternative preventive health approaches. The people ask, the pills I used since years do not help me. I use painkillers since months, since years, but the pain always is present, especially in patients like fibromyalgia, tension type headache, migraine patients. For them it's sometimes really difficult to do anything against the pain because they are really overdosed on painkillers. And so only our first step should be to try everything to avoid suddenly all the painkillers and this is possible. And three days later we will report they feel better. A similar thing we can observe in psychiatric patients caused by depression, anxiety. Very often they take four, five, six different antidepressives and are still depressive. Then I ask me anything should go or went wrong and we should try another possibility to do anything that they feel better. And that's the kind of wellness therapy as well. Also the medical professionals selecting courses of treatment because the patient asks and because it's also a possibility for the doctors to improve their possibilities to offer methods. Most countries the patient have to pay for all these methods but it's not the question in most patients. They are really asking what can I do else without any medications. And this corporate wellness professionals deciding also employee programs for doctors, for trainers, for medical staff, to train the staff and the doctors to help the patient to use methods he could believe uh, in, in the future. It's something like uh, a hard science and best practices for core wellness related approaches and disciplines. So the patient can get help if you use different methods. Wellness therapies, we know lots of them. You know them and you have experience with lots of them maybe. And I picked out a couple of these methods to improve their efficacies using, uh, to, to improve their efficacies to treat the patients, to relieve the symptoms and to help them. One of them, the mentioned biofeedback. What is, what is biofeedback? The work tells that the patient can see signals produced in his body biological sickness and he sees them, he gets a feedback how his own body is functioning, how it's working. And before you buy a feedback, the patient has to learn and has to understand why he got ill. What are the mechanisms that make me ill? He had something like to understand the pathophysiology of his symptoms. And if he said no, and you described him how the mechanisms were going on to get ill and he comes by himself, maybe on an idea, oh, if this is the way I got ill, then I can try to do anything else to avoid this. And he can learn this, but to learn this, he needs biofeedback, how his body is working, and that's the possibility to show him the signals related to his symptoms. It can be the heartbeat, the respiration, the muscle activity, the skin conductance activity, and anything which is in any way related to pathophysiology of his symptoms. And so I highlighted these two methods, biofeedback, and in this can, for example, meditation, because the other methods are very often used is medical hypnotherapy. It's a kind of meditation or a kind of deep relaxation. And so I will try to introduce more more both methods and maybe give a short demonstration as well after lunch. Biofeedback is not a new method. It was used 100 years before in physiological treatments. It was very simple to measure symptoms or biological signals of the body and show the patient how it's functioning and then you can try to learn to influence these signals. So biofeedback is a psychophysiological tactic for helping an individual to become conscious of otherwise unconscious body processes. He can conscious see how the body works, what normally works automatically. And automatically he got ill. And if he sees how it was possible and understood how it was possible, he can try to do anything against this. Through convenient information about for example, electrodermal activity, 
the sweeping activity of the sweeping glands on the fingertips, on the food zones, similar like the methods used in a lie detector, for example. And the lie detector can detect a lie, and using this method as a diagnostic and therapeutic tool in medicine, we can find out what's happening wrong, or what's working wrong in the body, or the heart rate, respiration, the blood volume rates, the skin temperature, muscle tension, in real time. And that's important that the patient can online see on a screen how his body is worked, related to parameters which are in correlation to his disease or illness. So biofeedback aims to raise awareness and conscious control of the related physiological activities. I tell the patients he is learning something like the development <coughs> of a new software which is stored on his heart disk in the brain and the best would be he can start with software automatically when the body feels anything more strong and then he can automatically stabilize body functions which normally should cause the symptoms like pain, depression or anxiety. Physiologically it is a method of conditioning processes. The brain is able to make conditioning to learn what he has trained and then he can apply these learned methods like learned driving a bike for example. You know you learned as a child driving a bike then you can put the bike away 10 years and you can again on the bike and you can drive. And that's the thing with learned processes never get lost. And so the patient has profit all over the time after the treatment as well. In a sense, biofeedback attempts to use the mind control of the body. Biofeedback in the sense of well-being, targeting well-being, biofeedback can be effective, reduce stress, depression, pain, and anxiety. The related parameters, for example, to do anything against stress is the electrodermal activity and the peripheral blood volume pulse measured in the fingertips, for example. We know that patients under chronic stress are followed by pain, or stress can cause pain. Today also the orthopedics accept that 70% of neck pain, back pain, tension hepatic is caused on psychosomatic pathways not by any orthopedical reason. And what's happened, what can be done against this, to give a patient the chance to reduce all what produce stress. And these parameters are very effective to do it. Depressive patients, they can use also the electrodermal activity, the skin temperature, to learn something, to improve their mood, to avoid anxiety reactions. For patients with pain, can use the EMG, the muscle activity, and if a patient with neck pain, for example, can see that he cannot relax the muscles in his neck, in the shoulders, then he is very astonished at first, because he thought, I am relaxed, but if you press the muscles, it's painful for him. And so he must get see that his muscles are not relaxed, even if he tells you, I feel relaxed. And if he sees that, then he can try to learn really to relax his muscles. Symmetrically, left and right side, to learn to keep relaxed in the lift as well. So pain and anxiety, stress, depressions are the most common symptoms in the patients which use this method biofeedback to do anything in the kind of well-being. If it's possible to relieve the symptoms, the patient feels very happy, and if he knows that he doesn't need any pills to do that, is more happy. How it works? Biofeedback. It's a learning process. And the first step is the patient must understand what he has to do. He must understand how his symptoms were generated in the body. He must understand by his knowledge, by his language, the pathophysiology of the symptoms. And then the perception of body functions, heart rate, respiration, electrodermal activity, blood flow, muscle tone, can get measured. To put a sensor anywhere on his body, an electrode, any possibilities to measure with different physiological parameters, and then these parameters can get amplified in any way 
and then he can see them on a screen. And then his brain must decide what I can do to influence these parameters, what I can do to reduce my muscle tension, what I can do to improve my peripheral blood flow. And then he see if it's possible. He must find own ideas, own minds to do anything against the pathophysiology of his symptoms. And if he influences the body function in terms of the aim of the therapy, the next step is that he practice skills with and without the response of body function changes. And this practice consists of training, training, training. Because conditioning processes only can get stored on the hard disk in the brain. If it's trained several times, and we know from clinical studies which have been done, that it takes approximately 10 training sessions to finalize the programming of a software for self-regulating these processes. If you use the EEG, the so-called neurobiofeedback, a very common technique in some specific diseases, it takes much longer than used by use of its peripheral body functions. Just an example how it works using this electrodermal activity, very simple, on two fingers or on the foot soles, and with skin conductance level or electrodermal activity, similar words for the same, reflect the level of psychological and physiological arousal elicited by cognition or emotion, that's the simple lie detector again, or caused by pain, depression, or anxiety. And relaxation and activation can get measured. Corresponding processes now must get conditioned. And then you can learn to do or to develop mechanisms to avoid the symptoms. It looks like that, for example, it's an amplifier which is fitted on his arm, the, end, the sensor is fitted on a finger, and here just an example how a signal with skin conductance response can be seen in a couple of minutes. I told the patient, try to relax, and it was a normal healthy volunteer, it was simple, it was very easy for him to keep relaxed over a couple of minutes. After that, I presented him a stimulus, and it was a mental task. I asked him, please make a mathematical calculation from 217 minus 13, and so on. And this is suddenly stress, because he lost the ability to calculate. We always use our mobile comp components. And so it made stress. And this stress caused an increase, a sudden increase in the skin conductance reactivity. And then I asked, two, two seconds later, we can stop the calculation, we have seen how your body reacts, try to relax again. Because it was normal, no pain, no depression, he felt really normal, he could relax after that immediately. And he finished on a higher level as before, why not, uh, it's possible. Another example shows how it really can get used to make a stress test for diagnostic, as a diagnostic tool to see if it's a normal patient or a stress overloaded patient. I have here a pathological reaction and a normal reaction, normal healthy volunteer, and ask them at first try to relax for five minutes. The normal person could relax and the skin conductance activity, just look on the back lines here, can get down and he can really relax over the time. The patient, the chronic pain patient, combined with depression and stress, could not relax. Just the information try to relax increased his stress level. And we can see and measure that the stress level is increasing. At this time point, I told the patient, a couple of minutes later, I will give you a further stress. I didn't tell him what I will do. The normal reaction is, there is a, there is a short answer, as an orientation reaction, it increases and goes back to normal level again. The patient is increasing again. The stress he is awaiting caused a reaction that made him more and more uh, feeling uncomfortable. Then the stress suddenly appeared. It was also a mathematical task. It also can be another question you tell him. It can be a stress produced by light or by sound. 
and you'll see the reaction of the stress, the skin conductance reactivity is increasing in the normals as well in the patient. And after the stress, I told the patient, and now try to relax again. It's not a problem for a normal one, he can relax. The patient keeps on this high level for more than 10 minutes or longer. It shows that a chronic stress patient or a chronic pain patient, each stress is improving his symptoms and he will not get able to do anything to relax, for example, to relieve pain, to relieve depression. This is a patient who had anxiety. It was a stroke patient and after good rehabilitation, he got angry and developed anxiety. I couldn't get any time further complications. And this anxiety made him really ill. He was well rehabilitated, could move lots of things which had done before. And so I measured the skin conductance activity again and asked him to try to relax. And we see, because he was an anxiety patient, it was not possible for him to relax. The skin conductance activity is increasing, increasing, increasing. At this time point, I asked him, try to remember the time before you had the stroke. He could remember. It's caused by an increase of his reaction. And after that, I asked him, and now try to keep relaxed. It was not possible. The skin conductance activity increased, increased, and increased. This is an example which shows how stress can influence other body functions as well. The thing I did here in a healthy world here was I measured the electrodermal activity, the EMG on the shoulders left and right sided, and the peripheral blood volume pulse, the peripheral capillar blood flow. And he put on headphones, and over the headphones appeared just an acoustic stimulation some similar like a click, 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 each time. And after each acoustic stimulation, we see a sudden increase of the electrodermal activity. It's a normal reaction. If a click disappeared, we could normalize this very fast. It, because it was normal, the click made a physiological answer. After the answer, the reaction was again normal. The second click, the same again, again, again. Here yeah, I finished the acoustic stimulation and he kept in low ranges and was relaxed. What's happened in the muscles? Each acoustic stimulation, each stress stimulus caused the muscle tone suddenly increase. You see, the EMG activity already is increasing after this short click over the headphones. It normalized very fast. If he would be a patient, a chronic pain patient, for example, and gets more and more stress, more and more any kinds of stimulations in his daily life, then the muscle tone never will come back to normal ranges. The muscle tone will decrease and will increase and will increase. And what's the result? Pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, frozen shoulders, tension type headache, symptoms are related to pain. Another reaction of the body is the change in the peripheral blood flow in those patients. If the stress appears, the peripheral blood flow is suddenly increasing. This is the diameter of peripheral blood vessels. If the stress appeared, the diameter was tightened. After the stress, it normalized. If a series of acoustic stimulation was finished, the peripheral blood flow kept normal. It's cause if chronic patients, if patients with chronic stress, chronic pain, are living over months, over year, with the stress conditions, with the pain, with the depression, the peripheral blood, blood flow is decreased and they get really peripheral disturbances in the blood flow. This is an example in pain and depression patients measured the electromyographic activity. Here we see two things. The activity of the muscles can get measured in microvolts. Here we measured 11.7, on the other side 19.08 microvolt, and we know from physiological measurements that it should be less than 4 microvolts. If a muscle can get produced 4 or less microvolt, the muscle is relaxed. If a muscle cannot achieve this value, the muscle keeps in a strong 
over constriction over the time and the muscle cannot get relaxed. And we see lots of impulses produced suddenly by the muscles. I told the patient, try to relax your shoulder muscles, try to relax your face muscles. It was a little bit possible, the spotted line shows a little bit the relaxation was possible, but he was not able to keep that state to tell that's a normal uh, muscle extension. Another patient, it was a patient with spastic paralysis, pre and four weeks after the beginning of his non-medicational treatment. We see again the increased values, very high, the muscles cannot get relaxed, and we see spontaneous activities during the time. I didn't tell the patient anything. I just asked him if it could be possible to relax prior, if not keep anything un unchanged. And the muscle activities in increased and increased. After the treatment, and during the four-week treatment, he learned mechanisms and techniques to reduce his muscle tensions, to reduce his muscle activities. And several kinds of treatments for the breathing techniques, or the other method I'll introduce you later on, hypnotherapy can give a patient the ability to relax. And here we see after these four weeks, we measured 6.8, 8.5, much less than the time before. He could learn to relax the muscle by himself and was able to learn new motoric functions uh, which helped him to reactivate any processes which were lost during uh, the stroke history. Another important method which is used as biofeedback is the so-called respiratory sinus or sinus arrhythmia. It's a normal mechanism in each body, in each healthy body, that the respiration is triggering our heartbeat. Here we see he breathes in, breathes out, breathes in, breathes out. And here we see the corresponding changings in the heartbeat rhythm, in the heart frequency. It's a normal reaction, and this so-called heart rate variability is a normal function in our body. If this variability gets lost, the heart will stop its function soon. And to see it easier, I zoomed a part off here. It looks like that. You can see if you breathe in and out, short after the in breathe, the heart rate is increasing from value 65 to 70, goes down when he breathes out, and this correlation can get shown the patient to tell him if he can see such a picture, his cardiovascular functioning is normal. And very often patients who have developed anxiety because maybe the father died on a cardiac stroke and the people have anxiety and are angry. Oh, it could be happen a situation also can follow up with me. And if he sees that this regulation looks normal, but before you have told, you must tell him how it works, that it is normal, he must understand his mechanisms, then he learns to avoid this anxiety very fast. And it works really fast, two, three sessions and he feels much better. You can also use situations the patient likes. It's a situation during the feedback of the signals you can shall tell him or show him slides or videos and show him, try to remember the time when you walked there and then he can use this imagination to relax and to see if it's possible with feedback of his nice situations to learn, is the, to learn to activate a normal reaction in his cardiovascular functions. It's also a possibility in patients who are angry to fly. Yeah, it is a method where the patient can learn to lose the anxiety to fly. And it's also supported by different airline companies. They support this kind of therapy because they know it really works very fast. They do not do it to help a patient they hope he buys a ticket after that. Also, it's very common at, when, at this time that variables are applied by a feedback for well-being. Lots of variables are on the market. And the more we get angry and concerned about illness and
and abnormal body reactions the more well-being is disabled. And our target is to improve the well-being. So sensible parameters like heart rate and respiration can get used to, to, to show the patient each day, for example, if his cardiovascular functions are normal or not. And variables like the all-known Apple Watch, for example, can give us an important information to help to relax. You know how it looks. And here we see a um, possibility of a heart rate recording, the ECG, and every beat is not the same like before. That's the normal thing, the so-called heart rate variability, is a simple measure of a variation in the time between each heartbeat. Between each heartbeat. The forward heartbeat has never along the same distance as the heartbeat before. So this variation is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. It works regardless of our desire and regulates, among other things, our heart rate, blood pressure, breathing, digestions, for example. And if a patient can follow up, for example, his daily recorded heart rate frequency changes, he can see the things which give him a feedback to learn to feel good or to give him a signal, I have to do something to normalize if there is an abnormal measurement. Yeah, and so this heart rate variability is a non-invasive way to identify autonomic nervous system imbalances. And if there is an imbalance, then there is not a good basic for rehabilitation, for wellness, for well-being. The healthier the autonomic nervous system is, the faster you are able to switch gears, showing more resilience and flexibility, there is a significant relationship between low heart rate variability and worsening depression or anxiety. A low heart rate variability is even associated with an increased risk of death and cardiovascular disease. And people who have high heart rate variability, they have greater cardiovascular fitness and are more resilient to stress. And that's what basic, the cardiovascular ba uh, basic for well-being and wellness. This heart rate variability may also provide a personal feedback of, of your lifestyle, about the lifestyle, and help to motivate those who are considering taking steps toward a healthier life. How it looks in practice, for example, using this kind of Apple Watch, it measures the heartbeat, and you can record your ECG on the watch and it calculates this heart rate variability over the whole day, 24 hours, as long as you take the, the, the watch on the arm. And in the evening you can check the records on your mobile phone and to see here, for example, the heart rate variability over the day was uh, 38 milliseconds. It's a normal value. If a patient would see it's 5 or 4 or 8, it's a signal which is not good, then he has to do anything to do to improve his heart rate variability. And that's possible with a kind of biofeedback training I showed you just before. It also gives you an overview over a week or a month, and you see you can follow up that he was normal. Over the whole week here, it was my one, uh, I have seen it was not below 25 in normal ranges. And if a patient has this biofeedback information of his cardiologist, cardiovascular body functions, he tells himself, oh, my heart beats normal, I feel normal, and I have a good basis to do anything to keep on normal in the future as well. It's also possible to use um, the mobile phone, or for example, the tablets we use. There exists a mobile system which measures the skin contact with activity, for example, and so the patient can train using an online recording of his parameters and he see the answer on the screen of his mobile device, how he can learn to do anything to relax. The aim is to increase the skin conductance response by stress, by mental activation, and try to relax after that and keep relaxed. And if a patient is used this once a day, in the evening, for example, he feels not only much, not only much better in the evening, he also can sleep better. Because he goes into the bed with the information, oh, I can relax, I have seen it, and it works, and I feel good, 
and send before gets all the trouble which may be causing disturbances to start to sleep. So this kind of wellness therapies to increase one's well-being and to minimize the chance of becoming ill. So the take-home message could be biofeedback is really an effective method to increase one's well-being by self-regulatory processes. And that's the question most of the patients are asking, what can I do by myself? Not only dependent on machines or techniques or medication from outside, what can I do by myself? And when he learns that, and can program this hard disk with his new software, he will get these conditioned processes over time of his life. The other therapy I mentioned, this kind of hypnotherapy, I tell it always medical hypnotherapy, because there are several techniques which can get used to produce a state similar like hypnosis. Hypnotherapy is a guided hypnosis or a trance-like state focused on concentration achieved with the health director in direct suggestions of a clinical hypnotist, for example. It's a method to tell the brain to do something. But we remember, especially in Western countries, hypnotherapy was in the last 10 years. 10 years before, it was difficult to use it because most psychiatrists or psychotherapists told it's a method which is not scientific approved. It's something like nothing. It is not available. It, it should not get used as a therapy method. It's, it's a, like a show. Today we know hypnotherapy is a scientific-based therapy. We know that there is that there are lots of mechanisms we can measure in the brain when you change the functional arousal in the brain. So it's possible to measure the functional MRG, MRT, for example and you see changes between normal state and state of hypnosis, hypnotherapeutic state. Hypnosis is a state where the brain is deeply relaxed, where the body is deeply relaxed. The patient is sitting in a chair and maybe can't open the eyes, can't move arms and legs. But during this deep relaxation, the brain structures where information processing is performed, where deciding processes are realized, which parts of the brain by the hippocampus, the formats regularis. All these structures are really high activated and it shows the ability during this state we are better or we can better influence by words, by suggestions than in a awake state. And this activation of the brain can be seen in this functional MRT. Yeah. It was measured also in the functional MRT what's happening in the brain if you give a patient a suggestion. If you tell him, avoid any thoughts that may you ill, for example, just an example. The brain memories this information. The brain always memories what you told him. And you can see these encoding processes on the surface of the brain. And this stored information can then recall it every time by the patient himself. So these processes you activated by suggestions, by words, in this deep relaxative state, can get recalled and you see the activation in the corresponding structures is sometimes more than in the time before the encoding processes. In a patient in a wake state, not in a hypnotic state, got the same encoding processes to see it's similar to that in hypnosis and later on when you recall the data you told him for example much less activation on the brain like in the state of hypnotherapy. So it's really the physiological explanation that this kind of therapy is a neurophysiological treatment or not nothing like a show or something like that. The patients, we all are very able to change things in our body by influencing from outside. You remember by yourself uh, everything we, uh, we see in the daily life, advertisements in the newspapers, in the TV. You see in this advertisement the first time, you decide by yourself, oh, it's not interesting for me, I will not do it, I will not buy it. 
you see the same advertisement the next week again, 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 and you see the same on TV, and you hear it on the radio, in the car, and suddenly your brain makes the decision, independent on your mind, I really can't do it. Uh, and a week later, you will tell us, oh, why I did it. And so, it's the brain, we all are sensitive to get information from outside, and our brain can react. It's also different from sleep. The state of functional hypnosis or deep hypnosis is very different in the sleep or in the EEG. It's a functional EEG I measured during 20 minutes of sleep and during 20 minutes of hypnotic state. So it's just different frequencies with different colors encoding different frequencies in the brain, which physiologically explain if he sleeps or if his brain is doing anything other else. So it looks, I measure this functional EEG in a patient, for example, before I started uh, to take him over into an hypnotic state. And then it looks like that. He is sitting in an armchair, deeply relaxed. He cannot move arms and legs. He cannot open the eyes. So the medical hypnotherapy is very contraproductive for circumstances and situations that should get avoided if a patient is depressive, for example. It's an enemy for every kind of well-being, for every kind of treatment that feels better. But the hypnotherapy can really fast help. And the experience is that you will apply direct or indirect suggestions to tell the brain that it has something to change. It starts to change it immediately. And it starts it to do it every day and every time later. I got experiences that patients after two, three therapeutic sessions felt much better pain got less and to well-being increased. And that's why I use this method now 25 years and several times a week, several times a day and uh, see what really can change in our mind, in our brain, if we tell the brain to do it. We have all the capabilities in our brain for self regulatory process. We have a genetic code which enables us to react normally. But this normal reaction can get lost by pain, by diseases, by stress. And that's the possibility we have to normalize this by ourselves. But during pain and during stress, these abilities are nearly blocked. They cannot work. And if you make this way free by this kind of technique, then the brain is able to look to lots of things which the time before nearly disappeared. Yeah, so this message is that the medical hypnotherapy is really an effective method just to tell the brain what it should do to increase one's well-being by suggestive methods. The method I mentioned as well at the beginning of my talk, the PCR, biological cell regulation, some of you may know the method. It's not a new technique. I have been the one in Germany, I think, who proved and got experiences with this machine since 20 years and I followed up all the technical developments and put the experiences using this technique into the development of machines that appeared on the market later on. The basic is that the metabolic situation in the biological tissue must get maintained for successful well-being. It's difficult to tell the brain normalize your metabolic situation. It's possible by hypnotherapy. But you can use another method as well. Very low electrical currencies in a range, in a micro ampere range, below one milliampere, in different frequencies, from very low to high frequencies, the metabolic situation in the tissue can get changed. And so we know from clinical studies in selected cells, in selected fibroblasts, in isolated fibroblasts, for example, that after this electrical stimulation, the synthesis of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is suddenly increased. And it can get measured that this substance, which acts as fuel in any cell, any cell needs this substance to transport substances inside the cell, to transport other substances outside of the cell, to normalize the electrical situation at the cell membrane, this substance can get increased during one session using this technique on 400%. But after the session, the value goes back again. The more and more the patient can use this method, this increased level of HP synthesis keeps on. 
And so the increase of transmembranal transport processes normalize the function of the brain, for example. The synaptic transmission of the brain can get improved. The information processing in the brain can get improved. So this method is not only a kind of therapy for pain patients or for stroke patients, it's a possibility to improve the ability of the brain to can place the electrodes around the head to do this in the brain cells as well. And so I very often combine this method, for example, with hypnotherapy. In the time the patient lies down in a hypnotic state, I can place these electrodes where he has the problems and because it's just a very low feeling, in some patients they do not feel that there is a currency flow in the body, so it can be get effectively combined, the methods can get applied together. And so this metabolic situation in bodily tissue must get maintained for successful reorganization as a basis for well-being. In patients with paralysis, immobilization, combined with degeneration or inflammation and or loss of energy causes modifications in the intracellular metabolism and with deviation from the normal tissue specific enthalpy. And this energy, this enthalpy is a thermodynamic system like each cell of our body. And this metabolic situation can get changed, can get normalized using these very low currencies to apply them. So it looks, here electrodes are placed, uh, the patient had problems with the arm, and I measured the results ongoing on four pairs of electrodes, and to see just three, five, six minutes after the beginning of a therapy, the increased, nearly normalized state of this metabolic situation, uh, the background of this parameter called metabolic situation, is the pH value, are the differences in extracellular electrolytes, something like that, and it really acts very fast, it's normalized very fast. This is an example in a patient after stroke, where the muscles should get normalized, the body function, the, the function of the muscle system should get improved. He used it the first day, just one session over 24 minutes, and the metabolic situation was put, was here in a place where it is told it's not normal. Normal would be between these two black lights. The same treatment the second day and the third day, when you see how it's increasing, or on the third day it's nearly normal. And if you continue this kind of therapy, it keeps normal. And then the muscle is prepared for better regeneration, for activation by rehabilitative processes by techniques in different fields of rehabilitation. If a muscle is not prepared, it takes much longer to come back to normal muscle activities. And so this method can really improve the possibilities to have patients after stroke, for example. And now I will show you an example that um, it's a little bit away from well-being, maybe also not. We use uh, smartphones in the daily living. We use it since years, every day, lots of hours sometimes. And if you walk through the streets, all the pupils, all the young people always wear a smartphone anywhere on the head or in the hands and so on. And I got the idea to see what's happened in our blood flow, in the red blood cells, for example, in the erythrocytes. They get dramatically disturbed by using the head, uh, by the, 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 the mobile phone. How it looks, there exists a specific method of microscopic investigation. The dark field microscopy, it's a normal condition, shows us where the red blood cells are flowing in the tissue. And here, before using the mobile phone, they are fluting free. The surface is free, they can bind all the oxygen which we breathe in. And so the oxygen saturation is normal. Then I asked uh, this healthy volunteer, and now use your smartphone and keep it for 10 minutes on your ear, near the brain, and do nothing, just keep the, iPhone, uh, the, the phone on your head. What's happened? After 10 minutes use, 10 minute use of a headphone, 
we see a little change in the slides compared with the state before. It's nothing nearly changed. A couple of minutes later, 20 minutes after 10 minutes use of mobile phone, the erythrocytes glue, start to glue together. Like, like an adhesive reaction, they really glue together and one hour later, it looks like that. Add a wrong slide, maybe here. I show this. After 10 minute use without PCR as a technique, which can also normalize the metabolic situation in the red blood cells, the normal picture. And since we have a situation where the erythrocytes glue together, that's a macrophage with blue dot, and by using now PCR technique, the metabolic situation which make an adhesive glue of the erythrocytes can get reduced, and then it looks like that. One hour after a 10 minute use of mobile phone, the situation was normalized. It means if you use the smartphone, the oxygen saturation of the erythrocytes in the blood is dramatically reduced for a couple of minutes, maybe for an hour or longer, where the more often you use the phones or the, 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 the mobile phone. Nobody knows what it really means. Nobody knows if there will be maybe further illnesses 10 years later. It should be, can be. But uh, the message should be, do not use mobiles and smartphones. No, we will use them, we must use them. But if it's possible, we could try to use, for example, loudspeakers or wire headphones. The wireless headphones also produce radiation, which, for example, can change the blood flow in the tissue. And so it's important to do anything to stabilize the whole body metabolisms using PCR, not only because you will never miss your smartphone, it's just part of the NBA. And it shows that the method, like this PCR technique, can influence the metabolic situation, not only in the muscle, where it's in most cases used, and in tendinous tissue, or in the brain, also in the blood. And so it's also a part of regeneration, of stabilization of the situation of the body, a part of the awareness of the NBA. So it looks, you have seen maybe such systems there's a very new coming on the market this year later on, uh, which was developed in Germany and produced there as well, and will be at first sold in the Asian market, maybe in Thailand at first as well. Uh, it has the possibility not only to produce electrical activity to influence the metabolic situation in the muscle, it can be like an, an intelligent system which can change the activation, the metabolic situation by continuously measuring what's happened in the tissue, how the situation is changed. It looks like that. The system, if the screen is on, you can see at first, when you start the treatment, the resistance you measured in the tissue at start, and then you see different colored lines on the screen, how the resistance can get changed over time of treatment. Life resistance reading and this blue line is moving, and the target should be to come into these green values, but this scale reflects measurements of uh, tissue resistances between 0 and 100. 50 is the normal range. It reflects a value of 95 kilo ohm, and that's the thing that the machine is done by per cell. The measurement of individual resistance in tissue at the beginning of the therapy, during the therapy, and also after the therapy. So the patient can really online follow up, also a kind of biofeedback, to see what's happened in this bodily tissue using this technique. There's a this scale uh, developed by a German physiologist lots of years before, shows that there are differences in the tissue activity dependent if it's a degenerative process or an inflammatory process, and so the normal range can get achieved by applying these currencies. So the PCR system incorporates the therapy, it measures the electrical resistance, the state of cellular metabolism in the scale, and so it's a balanced energy which results. Using artificial intelligence systems in the PCR machines, 
shifts the resistance from where it is at the start towards the 50 or 95 kilo ohms range, so the patient has an online reading how it normalizes in his body. There's also the resistance start, live reading uh, of the resistance, and the patient can do it by himself at home several times a day, dependent on what he will do. Now, and this kind of biokubernetics is something like an artificial intelligent algorithm because he measures and he can change the currency and so he can change the, in, uh, the stimulatory processes in the tissue in a way which always keeps the pain to normalize it very fast. And so you can, for example, at first start to attack and scan like a diagnostic value. Later on, you can start a control loop in, within the therapy. And during the therapy, the system always measures and tells you if there is an influence by an interferences from outside. The target now should be make a normalization. The target controls if you must start once more, start the session, for example, once more, or it would, if it was able to normalize the metabolic situation very fast. So the target should be, and that's the thing the patient is seeing on the screen after the session as well, how fast he normalized the metabolic situation from green to, from green over yellow, white or green, dark green, how we can see how it really normalized. And that's the new thing in this technique, in this development of this microcurrency techniques by PCR techniques. I thought it will be on the market maybe in October. So the take home message concerning PCR therapy could be it's a necessary method to prepare and to stabilize the body's tissue, to regenerate and to protect from sick making influences also in time of well being. And so I with my message or my experience over the years I use this method in combination together that it's a good possibility to have patients not only to keep healthy, but also to stay healthy in a kind of well-being. And that's my neurophysiological or psychophysiological description of wellness as well. You know, wellness is a very wide field and it starts everywhere in the body and it starts also in this self-regulatory processes the patient can get introduced the brain can get told to change things and it feels better. That's the message in my first talk. I hope I gave you some new ideas on the possibilities which are, which are able, which can be done, which can helpfully uh, use as alternative methods combined with other methods you have at your sites as well. How it looks, for example, biofeedback practically maybe can get shortly demonstrated later on after lunch. So the wellness therapies like biofeedback can condition self-regulatory processes, medical hypnotherapy can influence biokubernetic processes, and PCR can improve metabolic situations altogether and repeated application will cause new conditioning processes like new software on the artist on a computer the body can do is on the hard disk of his brain. At each training session, the more and more the patient can do it by himself at home, it's like a small update in the developing process of his progress of the office software. So the message should be train the brain to keep us healthy. And so that's a mechanism which often is not done by himself. He should open his way at this method that all you can do this. And so I also tell the patient, don't give up, because the brain is enormous adaptive. It waits just to get challenged, and then it takes less time as a waited to live the well-being. And it's important not the patient only tell about well-being, we also should do for ourselves something to live well-being, and send the patient to see how it can be done. Thank you for your attention.